If, like me, you were a child of the 90s, the following is likely a familiar sight and sound. However, you might be more familiar with a slightly different version. Windows for Workgroups, also known as Windows 3.11, began appearing two years before Windows 95 would hit store shelves. For me personally, it came pre-installed on a Packer Bell system I got for Christmas. As a kid, I often wondered, what was the difference between this and the copy of Windows 3.1 that was on my dad's PC? As it turns out, there are actually quite a few differences. Comparing a default install side by side, the two versions, at least at first glance, appear indistinguishable. As you can see on screen, a few applications got minor UI tweaks. For example, Print Manager now has a more modern toolbar, but on the whole, there isn't that much of a difference. On a fresh install, the largest change is the new Network Group, which on a default install only has four applications, Net Setup, Microsoft Mail, Schedule Plus, and Remote Access Service. Windows for Workgroups is actually the combination of two separate products rolled into one, specifically the Windows 3.11 upgrade and the Microsoft Workgroup add-on for Windows. Let's talk about the 3.11 upgrade first. By itself, the 3.11 upgrade had a relatively small number of bug fixes and changes from the base version, and it was essentially a service pack. This, of course, leaves us with the other half of the equation, specifically the four workgroups part. Unless you worked out of a high-tech office, the odds are that most Windows users of the era would have no idea what this referred to or what it meant. So let's step back and talk about the original Microsoft Workgroup add-on, which was available for both DAWs and Windows as an expansion and replacement of Microsoft's original LAN Manager client. Throughout the late 80s and 90s, companies like Novell and Sun Microsystems would compete for network dominance with their own products. These solutions were often incompatible with each other and it furthermore had to run through DAWs, which in turn slowed the system down and often led to crashes and system instability. Recognizing a legitimate problem, Microsoft created the Windows Sockets API or WinSock that provided a common foundation for all network-based applications on Windows. Windows for Workgroups would be the first consumer version with integrated network and WinSock support. Furthermore, Microsoft had decided that their networking products should support peer-to-peer -peer mode Instead of requiring a central server like NetWare, every system could share resources directly without a central management server. The practical upshot is you only needed two or more copies of Windows to have a fully functional file and print server setup, drastically reducing the barrier to entry. Assuming a proper network card is installed, the net setup application is all that's needed to bring this potential to bear. For this video, I set up three separate instances of Windows named Lab, Dev, and FileSurf to simulate a free computer network. Network installation is straightforward, but there are oddities. Workgroup supports a large number of network technologies, but only NetBIOS and Novell's IPX are installed by default. TCP IP was available as a free add-on, however. After restarting, the first notable change is Windows asking for a login. The login entered here is used to store the password database and authenticate against LAN manager servers. Furthermore, the Networks Applications Group now has several other programs listed and a new network control panel. A quick check with Wireshark shows that Windows is in fact successfully communicating with the network, including using NetBIOS over IPX, a true product of its time. Now that we're fully up and running, let's walk through the basics. File Manager now has an option to share folders as well as mount network drives. Windows did not support UNC Pass at the time, so no, any network share had to be mounted to a drive letter. The standard Open and Save dialog gained a network button to make this easier as well. Likewise, Print Manager gained similar functionality. A few less obvious things also gained network functionality. For example, Clipboard Viewer, as the name suggests, lets you view the current contents of whatever you copied last. However, there is now the clipbook, which lets you store multiple snippets in one place. The network bit, however, comes into play from the fact that you could share multiple clipbooks over the network, creating a de facto database of knowledge. Hearts, which first appeared in this version of Windows, could also be played with up to three other players on the network. However, moving on to the network program group, let's start with Microsoft Mail. On first startup, Mail asked if you want to create a post office, which is a shared folder that holds the Mail database. As Mail was included with Windows for Workgroups, out of the box, and versions of it were also available for DAWs and OS2, it made for a quick and easy Office Mail solution. As I've already created a post office on FileServe, I'll simply connect to that where you can see I have a few test messages. 
Microsoft Mail would eventually evolve into the modern day Exchange and Outlook, and I intend to do a follow-up video exploring it more in depth in the near future. Continuing with the trend of applications that would evolve over time, Schedule Plus, as the name suggests, was a networked schedule. It integrated with the post office used by mail to share data, although it could also be used in a standalone fashion. Amusingly, it chokes on years later than 2019, thus I had to turn the clock back to get this to work. Once running, the level of integration is clear as user lists are shared between the two products. Meeting invites could be shared between users and there was a built-in messaging function as well. More interestingly, the product had a fairly advanced access control feature for this era. This is likely to prevent people from canceling meetings they did not want to attend. Having covered the primary productivity tools included, let's take a look at the miscellaneous utilities. Remote access service is the only program I can't demonstrate as I cannot easily emulate a serial modem. What it did is fairly easy to explain, however. RAS would allow a remote user to dial into Windows NT or LAN manager servers and then be able to use file sharing, network, and other NetBIOS applications. Note that I didn't say network applications. RAS only supported Microsoft's own NetBIOS protocol and has no support for TCP IP. As such, it could not be used by home users to access the internet. Continuing down the line, log on and off was used to sign in and out of the Windows network. This is the same login prompt seen when we first started Windows and is different from Mail or Schedule Plus's login. It was primarily useful if you had to switch between various networks. Speaking of different networks, NetWatcher allowed you to get a peek at who was talking to your computer as well as potentially any files they had locked open. It is also where the event log was hidden, which could record system startup, shutdown, and remote access attempts. As for notifications, anyone who has used Windows XP might be familiar with WinPopup or Messenger Service, as it was called in later versions of Windows. In short, it lets you send a message to another computer that would pop up on screen. Before it was removed in Windows Vista, WinPopup was primarily used by system administrators to announce messages and viruses to cause network spam. Speaking of notifications, chat does exactly what it sounds like. Finally, WinMeter shows various performance statistics, and with that, we can close out our brief tour of Windows for Workgroups. In closing, it's interesting to see how much Microsoft actually gave you in the box. However, many of these features would disappear over the years. It is clear that Microsoft's intent was to push out its competition, primarily Novell Netware, out of the market by simply including their competitors' functionality right out of the box. This practice would eventually get them in trouble with the U.S. Department of Justice, but that's a story for another day. As usual, if you've enjoyed this look at early 90s technology, please leave a like and subscribe. It really does make a difference. If you want to follow my adventures in real time, please follow me on Twitter or join me in Discord. The links are in the description. Until the next time, this is N Commander signing off. Have a great day.